Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad you are here with us today. You know, as Jason said earlier, if you could take a moment and hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel or follow us on Facebook, if you're not already, we would love to have you be part of our regular community. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 37? We're going to come to that in a moment. You know, for several months now, our pastors, elders, and leaders have been reading a book called The Neighboring Church, which forms the basis for this sermon and for several sermons coming after this one in the next few weeks. It will be actually a series will be taught by an entire pastoral staff, and I can't wait to get into the message. But before we get to that, I want to start by asking you a few questions. And I'm going to ask you if you're engaged in our chat or in the comment section at Facebook, just be ready, get your fingers ready. I want you to answer these questions. If you're watching this with someone, you can turn to that person and you know, share your answers with them. So, everyone ready? All right, here we go. Mountains or beach, where would you rather go? Just so take a moment and write it in you know, or share with the person next to you. Mountains or beach, beach what, what do you prefer? Where would you rather go? You know, personally for me, I'm, I'm a mountain guy. Um, there's actually a spot in the lower Himalayas. There's a, there's a, a town um, and that's one of my favorite spots in the world. I was actually there. Um, so I've been there several times. I was there 12 years ago, actually, with Paul Foss. And I can't wait to go there again. All right, next question. What is your favorite movie? You can share the answer with the person next to you, or you can uh, you know, drop a line in the chat or comments now. What is your favorite movie? Next question. What is your favorite movie? Ice cream flavor. Let the vanilla chocolate war begin. <laughs> what is your favorite ice cream, ice cream uh, flavor? You know, um, if, if you're curious to know, my, my favorite ice cream flavor is uh, the Hagen dazs pistachio ice cream. Um, actually, my daughter, my oldest, Elizabeth, every year for my birthday, she actually makes me homemade pistachio ice cream, which I believe, it might, it's my conviction, that's the best ice cream flavor in the world, and I'm willing to debate anyone on that. All right, next question. If you could travel to any country for free, which country would you pick? Really curious to see what you come up with for this one. If you could pick any country to go for free, which one would you pick? Next question. What is your favorite kind of food? What is your favorite kind of food? Clearly, the only right answer for this just saying. The only right answer. All right, last question. True or false? Batman would beat Superman in a fight. What do you think? Take a moment and write in the chat section, the comment section. Share, share your answer. All right, I'm going to come back to these questions in a bit. This is a very important week for us here at Damascus Road. You know, we are going to go deep into some of the most important words of Jesus to us. How to live, especially in these times, as people that are marked and sealed by the cross of Christ. We're going to look at what became known as the greatest commandment. We will ask ourselves, what is our Lord, our one and only Lord, asking me and us to do as a church in this stretch of our journey together? So if you have your Bibles, let's read these awesome four verses. Actually, if you're able to, Wherever you are, may I ask you to stand as we read from God's word. So just take a moment and just stand with me as we read these words. Here's what Jesus said matters most. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, we're going to immerse ourselves in these words of Jesus today and for the next several weeks. Thank you. You may be seated. Actually, let me say a prayer and then we'll dive in. Father, the words we are looking at are, are just so very precious to you. Would you anoint me? Would you anoint a church? 
Would you soak us in these awesome words that have the power to help transform not just our lives, but our community, our neighborhoods, and our world. So Lord, just take this time and do whatever it is you need to do in every heart and mind. And we pray this in the amazing name of our one Lord and one Savior, Jesus Christ. And the church, wherever the church is, said, Amen. Amen. So some 15, 20 years ago, I read a book by the name of The Knowing Doing Gap. The Knowing Doing Gap. The authors, who were business consultants, did research on large and small organizations. The opening lines of this book explains their objective for writing this book. Why do so much education and training, management consulting, and business research, and so many books and articles produce so little change in what managers and organizations actually do? They detail how many companies spend combined billions of dollars on consulting and training and research and learning, but their businesses did not improve and their employees weren't actually getting better at what they do. They give example after example of this in their book. I want to share one example from the book. A large electrical utility company hired two consultants from a leading management consultancy firm. They paid them a lot of money, millions of dollars. The consultants came in and they did interviews and they met with the employees, the managers, the executives, the leaders. They did a lot of research in the company, their history and their, their methodology, their work, their products and all of that, services. And they found out that the same company, this large electrical utility company, the same company had hired another consultancy firm several years ago. So they became curious about what did that consultancy firm suggest or recommend. So they dug out this other company's report, which was gathering dust on a shelf, and they found out that these other consultants had given the exact same recommendations that they had outlined. So these new consultants wrote this up, and I want to read to you a part of this new consultant's report. Here's what they wrote. The old 500-page document was very good. Our recommendations are basically the same. The problem was not analysis. It was implementation. The client already had the information we were giving them. Amazing, isn't it? This large electrical utility company had all the right information. They had all the right data, all the benchmarking studies and analysis. They had the knowledge. It was all in an old 500-page document gathering dust on a shelf. The problem with this company was that they simply did not put the information to use. They did not put their knowledge into practice. They thought simply having the information, the knowledge was enough. And that is where the authors came up with the title of the book, The Knowing Doing Gap. You have the information and the knowledge, but there's a gap between your knowing and your doing. You know what to do, you just don't actually do it. I want to propose to you today that this isn't just a widespread problem in the business world. It is also a significant issue in our own lives, in our churches. It is possible to gather a lot of information and knowledge about God, about Jesus, about the Bible, about the church even, but not actually put it into practice. I'm going to give you a personal example of this. A few weeks ago, I had to be at church to record the sermon for the week. And I was driving down Bartholos, and as many of you know, you know how the road dips down just before you hit the bridge over Route 70. So I was running late, and as I started on the dip in the road, I sped up. And as I came out on the other side, I see this police cruiser over the grass on the other side, and the officer holding a radar gun, and he pulls me over. So I stop, and I pull over. He came up to me, he asked me for my license, and then he said, sir, are you aware that the speed limit on this road is 40 miles per hour? I said, yes, I am aware of that. And he said, I clocked you going 58. He said, where were you going in such a hurry? So I said, I'm late for church. So he asked me, do you work at a church? I told him, yes. He asked me, what do you do? I told him I was the pastor of this church. And he said, that church up on a hill, you're the pastor. I said, yes. So he looked at me and he said, as a pastor, you know the importance of following the rules. You talk about this to your parishioners. And I was thinking fast, and I felt this was an opportunity to also teach some theology. So I said, that's right. 
But as a pastor, I also preach a lot about forgiveness and grace. Maybe you could show me some grace? I kid you not, the words just came out of my mouth before I knew what I was saying. So he's just standing there, he's just, you know, he's tapping my license in his hand, and he's got a little smile on his face. And then he looks at me and he says, okay, today I'm going to give you grace. If I catch you tomorrow, it's going to be judgment day. (laughs) And I'm like, I'm so good with that. I'm so good with that. Actually, we ended up talking. I invited him to come check us out, gave him our, our website, told him we have uh, several wonderful Christian police officers in our church. He said he would, so we'll see. Actually, you know what? If you are the police officer who stopped me and you're watching this, welcome to Damascus Road. You know, just let us know and we would love to send you some information. Now, the reason why I share this story with you is to say I had the knowledge and the information. The speed limit on Bartholos is 40 miles per hour. There are several signs on Bartholus telling me the speed limit is 40 miles per hour. I just did not follow it. I did not have a knowing problem. I had a doing problem. There's a book that came out a few years ago called Unchristian. And the authors talk about a survey that they did among young American non-Christians. These are people that don't go to church. Many of them don't believe in God. Here's... There was many amazing things in this book, but this one just blew me away. They did this survey, extensive survey among young American non-Christians. And what they found out is this, that 84%, 84% of young American non-Christians knew at least one committed church-going Christian. Think about this. 84% of young American non-Christians knew at least one committed church-going Christian. But... Only 15% of them said that there was any difference between a committed church-going Christian and a non-Christian. Only 15%. The authors write this statement in their book. The gap speaks volumes. The gap speaks volumes. You know, Jesus was extremely aware of this knowing-doing gap. He would challenge his followers on it. One time he said this. This is from Luke 6, 46. So why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? The debate for Jesus is not really about how people dress for church. It isn't about the kinds of songs people sing at church. And it isn't about the kind of food people prefer to eat. Although Jesus clearly prefers Indian. Right? The issue for Jesus in the Bible talks about this a lot. Is whether we're actually living out what we say we believe. And we will spend several weeks looking at the familiar words of Jesus in Matthew 22. And we're going to ask ourselves, am I actually doing this? We know this, but am I actually doing this? So let's take a look at this. I'm going to go back a couple of verses. Matthew sets it up this way, Matthew 22, 35. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Now, about this guy. He's not like a student in a class raising a hand to ask a question. This guy is an expert. In the law. In our day, we would say he's a seminary professor, he's a qualified theologian, he's probably equivalent to a Bible commentary writer in our day. He would have known the Old Testament really well, probably knew the Torah, the first five books of the Bible by memory. In other words, he already knows all the answers. When he's asking Jesus a question, he already knows the answer. He's heard about Jesus. And when he comes to Jesus, he's not coming as a student, he's coming to test Jesus. And this is what he asks Teacher, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the most important thing in the law? What matters most? That's what he wants to know. And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The entire law, all of the prophets can be summarized, can be encapsulated in these two things. His listeners would have been quite stunned. All 613 laws of the Old Testament can be summarized like that. And Jesus insists, yes, that's it. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, let me take a moment and step back a little bit. You know, you've often heard me talk about how important it is to step into the world behind the text because there's a lot more going on here than appears at first glance. You know, as a pastor, I've been at this for 25, 30 years now, you know, I often 
uh, have people come up to me and say at the beginning of the year, you know, I want to read through the Bible and I'll give them a Bible reading plan and, and encourage them to, to do it. And then a few weeks later, if I see them, I'll ask, how is your Bible reading going? And what I have found, this is just from my life experience, you know, talking to people, what I have found is that a lot of folks give up at about the six-week mark. At the six-week mark, a lot of people give up. Right around mid-February, people give up. That's when they get into Leviticus. See, Genesis and Exodus have these riveting stories, and then when people come to Leviticus with all its many rules and lists, they just give up. And I used to tell people, don't give up, you know, keep at it. Um, but, and this may be a little controversial for some people, but now when people tell me I'm stuck and you know, I just feel like I'm plotting, and I tell them, just skip Leviticus. Just go to the next book. Just, you can come back to Leviticus later on. But if you skip Leviticus, just remember this one verse, just one. In the midst of all the rules and lists, there's this five-word phrase in Leviticus 19.18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the first time in the Bible that the word love is used as a verb, a doing word. And it appears as a command to the Hebrew people wandering through the desert. In the midst of all kinds of lists, suddenly these words appear, bright as daylight, telling them, do this, follow this, obey this. That phrase and its meaning is then woven right through the rest of Scripture and into the pages of our New Testament. So when Jesus is saying those words, he's actually quoting the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18. What he's saying to the expert is not unlike what the consultant said to that large electrical utility company. What Jesus is saying is this, you're trying to test me and trap me into saying something new or radical. I'm telling you that the old document is still very good. Those old words of scripture are still filled with life-giving power. Those words are still valid. My recommendation is still the same. You already have the information I'm giving you. Your problem is not analysis, it is implementation. You don't have a knowing gap, you have a doing gap. And then the entire scripture builds on this premise of Leviticus 19.18. It speaks of love as something we participate in. It speaks of love as a dominant characteristic of God's people. It permeates our words. It should permeate our words, our thinking, our attitudes, our actions, reflecting what is true in the community of our Trinitarian God. So yesterday I was, as I was doing revision of this message, I came to this point and I took a break. And I opened my iPad, and I just hit the news app. And man, I tell you, I read several stories, and I started thinking about what's going on in our nation these days. The pandemic has people feeling scared and isolated. This just feels like there's no end to this. Highly polarized. I mean, I'm reading some of the things that are being shared in news. Highly polarized, vitriolic political discourses has intensely divided us into what seems like intractable groups. The verdict this week coming out of the Breonna Taylor's death is causing deep pain and anguish amongst our African-American brothers and sisters. And then I read another article, the senseless shooting of two police officers on Wednesday. And I read all this, and I, I just you know, shut my iPad, put it away, came back to this message, and I started to pray and think. And I kept thinking about what Jesus said matters most. Friends, if we are going to be a community of light, if we are going to be a voice of hope, if we are going to be a place of refuge, we need to buck the cultural pressure to isolate and demonize. We need to practice deeply in each of our own lives the words of Jesus. And we need to love God with all our hearts. And we need to love our neighbors as ourselves. I mean, it just, think about this. It blows my mind that this command in Leviticus, which appears totally without context, comes to God's people who are about to enter into the uncertain, conflict-ridden, morally chaotic world of the Canaanites. What this meant for them and what it means for us in a world filled with uncertainty, a world that is chaotic and conflict-ridden and divided, is that we are called to love regardless of how we feel. There is no confusion about this. Jesus says, just do it. There are no reasons offered. There are no promises. There are no rewards promised. If you call Jesus Lord, then love your neighbor. You know, later in the series, I will talk about how to love our neighbor in a conflict-ridden, politically polarized, stressed, and tense world. 
In the book of 1 John, he writes about a congregation that is having a lot of problems. And John actually, if you read this book, John actually names these problems. He talks about, you know, there are lies taking place in this congregation. He talks about there's hatred. He talks about deceit. He even uses scary words like children of the devil, the antichrist. This is not an ideal church that John is writing to. It is also not an unusual church that John is writing to. What John is saying here, and he's putting wings to the words in Leviticus, what he says here is that as transformed people of God, love is to be freely given. We are to be marked by a lifetime accumulation of acts of love. Love that is likely flawed, likely imperfect, likely inconsistent, but still it is love in spite of ourselves. Love God, love people. It's that simple and it's that hard. Shall we do a mass confession? I'm going to ask you wherever you are this question. If, if, this, if you know of one person, at least one person in your life who's hard to love right now, would you raise your hand wherever you are? If you know of at least one person, I, my hand is up because there's one person in my life who's very irritating to me right now. Do you know of at least one person? You know, if you're in our chat and comment section, you can drop a raised hand emoji right now and let us know if you know of at least one person who's very hard to love right now. Don't name them. Don't name them. You know, if you're watching this with someone, don't look at them. You know, just, just raise your hand. Just, just mass confession. Here's the truth. Sometimes people can be hard to love. They can disappoint you. They can gossip about you. They can hurt you. They can support a political party that is not the one you support. They can let you down. People can be hard to love. And I was thinking about this, friends, you know, as a church and as a pastor, you have to absorb so much. You know, over the years, you hear people say things and you go, this is such a wrong view of who I am or what I believe in. But what keeps me going is this. I look at the church of Jesus Christ and I see a community of people who like me, very much like me, want to love God with all their hearts and follow him faithfully. But we are a bunch of unfinished, selfless, neurotic, self-centered, stumbling, serving, forgetful, singing out of tune much of the time kind of people. That's who we are. I mean, this just struck me. Is it even plausible? Is it even credible that God would entrust matters of eternal significance to people like you and me? And some people look at all this and they shake their heads and they give up. And that right there is the difficulty of living a life marked and sealed by love in the company of the beloved. But the Bible keeps insisting this is the way. It keeps insisting on how we are to love one another, even though God knows how often and badly we fail at it. And Jesus says others will come to know about him because of this love we have for one another. He says the old document is still valid. The recommendations are still the same. Don't go looking for a new revelation. Just practice what you know. Love God. Love your neighbor. And you know what? The followers of Jesus Christ took this very seriously. I want to share a couple of examples with you. You know, In the ancient world, people who were poor and in need... Lower class people, they were disdained. They were almost discarded. But Christians lived differently. Not always perfectly, but differently. They remembered Jesus said, love your neighbors. A little piece of church history, you know, Aristides wrote this about Christians around 137 AD. This is what he wrote. It's on your screen. This is fascinating. He said, they, meaning Christians, do not keep for themselves the goods entrusted to them. They do not covet what belongs to others. They show love to their neighbors. They speak gently to those who oppress them. And in this way, they make them their friends. It has become their passion to do good to their enemies. If anyone among them is poor or comes into want, while they themselves have nothing to spare, they fast two or three days for him. In this way, they can supply any poor man with the food he needs. This, O emperor, is the rule of life of the Christians. And this is their manner of life. And I read this and I kept praying, Lord, please let, this, let that be true of me. Let that be true of our church. You know, Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, he believed that people came in two types, slaves and non-slaves. One time he said this, all those who are not Greek are born slaves by nature. That was Aristotle. 
Now, I want you to look at one of the earliest descriptions of the church. It comes to us from a guy named Pliny the Younger, who was a nephew of a guy named Pliny the Elder. So I guess Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger was kind of named just to distinguish between the two. But I've always wondered, why wasn't he called Pliny the Tiny? I mean, that just rhymes. I digress there. But anyway, so he was a Roman bureaucrat, Pliny the Younger. This is about 100 years after Christ. And the Romans were very intrigued and upset that Christians would not engage in emperor worship, that Christians would not pay allegiance to the pagan gods. So Pliny captures two Christians. They are slaves and they are women, so he could torture them without any fear of any consequences. And as he tortured them and he asked them, tell me about these Christians, what he found out was that the women were not only welcomed in the church, but they had been named deacons. These women, these slaves, were leaders in the, t- in the church. The church not only welcomed them and loved them, but gave them places of honor and service based on their giftedness. Actually made them leaders. After he had tortured these women, Pliny wrote a report to the emperor. I want to read to you a couple of sentences from this report. Keep in mind, he's describing the church. This is what he wrote. Many persons of every age, every status, and also of both sexes are at risk of joining the church. This contagion. I mean, think about this. He's, just, he's talking about the church. He's talking about the community of God. And he says, this contagion has spread not only to cities, but to villages and farms. And I could just stay here all day and list many, many more examples of how people took the words of Jesus seriously and followed them. Love God. Love your neighbor. And now it's us. So I'm asking every single one of us, friends, every single one of us, to make this commitment right now that there would not be a knowing, doing gap in your life, in my life, in our lives. We know we are to love God and love our... How many times have you heard this? Have I heard this? And there be so one, just like our spiritual ancestors, that take the words of Jesus seriously and put them into practice. Otherwise, Jesus says, there's, there's simply no point of calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say you should do. So how are we going to do this? Actually, this sermon is so close to my passion area. For years, you've heard me say how information alone is never enough. Information is not transformation. Transformation is information put into practice. You've heard me talk about Monday usables for years. So what's the Monday usable here? Let me start by asking you this. I'm just going to give you a moment. Do you know the names of your neighbors who live to your left, to your right? Do you know the names of the people that live on your street? This was an exercise that Paul Foss made us do a few weeks ago. And it was very convicting for a lot of us. How can we love our neighbor when we don't even know their names? So over the next couple of months, here's our goal. We are asking everybody that calls Damascus Road their home church to do three things. Number one, get to know the names of your neighbors. Get to know their names. Number two, Get to know the stories of your neighbors. And number three, pray for your neighbors. That's it. Get to know the names of your neighbors. Get to know the stories of your neighbors. And pray for your neighbors. You know, our director of communication, Trisha, made this awesome page on our website, damascus.com slash neighbor. It has a wealth of resources we'll be talking about over the next couple of months and beyond. you will find links there on how our children and young people and special needs folks can fulfill our Lord's mission as well. This is not a new strategy, by the way. This is not a new ministry model. This is not a new program. We believe the old document is still valid. We're just following the command given in Leviticus that Jesus then told us to actually do. He said, do this. Notice that I did not say we are going to evangelize our neighbors. Notice that I did not say our goal is to get our neighbors to church. If that happens, praise God. But that's not the overarching goal. The goal is to simply to get to know the names of our neighbors, the stories, as a first step toward loving them. See, we love our neighbors because we are Christians, not because we are trying to make them Christians. People are not projects. 
relational connection is our goal. You know, when we lived in Clarksburg, Eric and I had over the years built a lot of relationships with a lot of families on our street. We connected with a number of people. And over 10 years, two families ended up coming to our church. But we also remained good friends with half a dozen other families that never did. This is not about getting people to church. This is simply about loving our neighbors because Jesus said, do this. That's it. Do this. It can happen in a number of ways. Let me share one story that happened for me this last week. So my family and I, we moved to Iamsville three years ago, and we are still getting to know the neighbors on our street. And when we first moved in, I saw the large backyard and all the trees, and, and uh, I was a little hesitant, but Erica really wanted this house. Because, and the reason why I was hesitant is because being a handyman isn't really one of my top gift mix. Well, a few months later, this is three years ago, I realized I needed to cut some branches. So I decided it was time to go get some power tools. So I go to Sears, and the salesman comes up to me, and he said, what do you want? I said, give me a chainsaw for dummies. So he highly recommended this chainsaw, showed me how to work it, all the features it had. I'm like, yeah, give me that. So I was very proud. I was going to cut down all these branches. And Erica came out. We wore our gloves. I had my safety goggles on. I was fully equipped. And I was just going to cut down these branches, Andy. I mean, it was just, it was going to happen. It was going to happen. Well, I managed to cut through two branches before I sawed right through the chainsaw cord. It was a stupid design. It was a stupid design. You know, Erica, in the way only she can, she looked at me in an encouraging way, and she said, well, at least we got two branches. Now, I give you that story as a background to what happened this last month. You know, we had this big tree in our backyard, and a storm of lightning took half the tree down. We got the other half down, but now we did not know how to get rid of the tree. Well, this last week, you know, Chris Moody showed up, and then on Saturday morning, Paul and Dave Satry and 15 other folks showed up. Um, Pastor Clark, who is pastor of Difference Makers Church, who's becoming a very dear friend of mine, he came with two friends uh, from his church. The next thing I knew, within two hours, the tree was gone. Within two hours, the tree was gone. You know, Paul said, these men called themselves the chainsaw ministry. I said, I want to rename them. I want to call them the Texas Chainsaw Ministers. It's got a nice ring to it. Texas Chainsaw Ministers. Now, when the group just, had just arrived on Saturday morning, our next door neighbor, Corey, came out. And he's just looking at all the people there, all the men there. And he's like, hey, who are these people? And I said, these are my friends from church here to help me with this tree. So he nodded. He had a cup of coffee in his hand. Like, this is like 7.50 in the morning. And um, so he goes back into his house. A few minutes later... He comes out with his tractor, and he's right in the middle of the group helping haul these logs out of our yard. And that's him. That's Corey, right in the middle of all these men. And he's talking to them. The men are all talking to him. And here's the thing. Corey and I connected at a whole new level. We had a great conversation last night. And Eric and I talked to him, and he and his wife, Amy, they just moved here from Pennsylvania. And we're going to have them over for a meal in our backyard. Found out that they love Indian food. Great people. So I'm asking us to just take a simple step. Just say hi. Get to know the names of your neighbors. Pray for your neighbors. If they need help, help them. Love them. I started this message with some questions to give examples of safe questions you can use as an icebreaker to launch a conversation. Are there, are there any dangerous questions? Yes, of course there are. For instance, I won't go to a neighbor I don't know and, you know, the, and ask them this first question. Are you a registered Republican or a registered Democrat? That's a bad question. That's not a good question. You can start with simple ones and then simply get to know them. You know, I read a report this week I sent to our elders how depression among U.S. adults has tripled since the start of the pandemic. Mental anxiety and, and depression has just gone up. Two commonalities are few or no social interaction and overconsumption of media. These were the two common things among people who are depressed, anxious, stressed. I had a, a lot of conversations over the last several months. And 
I tell you, some people, man, the way they're describing our world, it's just this dark place, very conspiratorial, um, very apocalyptic, end of the world kind of view. Like there's no hope. There's no hope. And I was thinking maybe some of our neighbors are struggling and they could do with a friendly hello and a conversation. You could literally save someone's life. So will you make the commitment to take the words of Jesus seriously? Will you remove the knowing, doing gap in your life? If so, turn to the person next to you. If you're watching this with someone, turn to the person next to you and say, I will do this. I will do what Jesus is asking me to do. I will do this. If you're in a chat, a comment section, just say the words, I will do this. I will do this. I will pray. I will pray for my neighbors. I will pray. You know, I've reminded you so many times, every single time you pray, something happens. Every single time, every single time, I will pray. I will get to know the names of my neighbors. I will get to know their stories. I will do this. I will do this. I will obey Jesus. Make that commitment right now. No more knowing and not doing, but calling Jesus Lord and actually doing what he's telling you and me to do. I will do this. I'm not launching a new program. I'm making a call to obedience that we will do what Jesus is asking us to do. The old document is still valid. We don't need a new revelation. We don't need a new ministry model. We don't need a new program or a new event. We just need to follow what God has already revealed to us. Love him and love our neighbor. Listen to this closing song. It talks about living out of the overflow.
You know, James tells us that information alone can be deceiving. He says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. And Jesus said, what matters most is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I love your neighbor as yourself. I believe Jesus really meant what he said. I believe loving our neighbors is exactly what Jesus is calling us to do right now. And I believe loving our neighbors in this season of pandemic, uncertainty, divisiveness will unleash a wave of love and joy and peace in our region. Maybe for the very first time, we might even experience this deep abiding sense that we are actually doing what God has called us to do in our neighborhoods. And we will do it with hundreds of singles, and adults and children and young people and families all across our region. I believe we are launching into one of the greatest adventures this year by taking Jesus at his word and actually doing it, not just hearing it and knowing it, but doing it. I wanna encourage you as you take this step of getting to know the names of your neighbors stories of your neighbors and praying for your neighbors I want you to share those stories at damascus.com slash neighbor there's a box where you can share your stories that way we can encourage one another I truly believe this is going to be one of the most life giving experiences that we can have in this season I hope I hope that every single person watching this not just be hearer of the word but be doer that Jesus will not have to say about any single one of us why do you call me Lord when you don't do what I say that we will do this because Jesus said do this let's pray dear father Lord I pray that you would forgive us for the knowing doing gap in our lives Lord, you know how much our desire is to be fully committed to you and your word. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit power to equip and empower us as we take the baby steps in following your command to love our neighbors by getting to know their names, getting to know their stories, praying for them. Open our eyes and help us see them as you see them, people created in the image of God, people who are deeply loved by you. I pray for deep and abiding friendships to blossom in neighborhoods all across our region. For everyone who heard your word and said, I will do this, I will obey Jesus. I will not only call Jesus Lord, but will actually do what he's telling me to do. I pray that you will encourage our hearts, give us the words to speak so we can be agents of hope and healing, especially to those that are feeling lonely and anxious and depressed in this season. And once again, Father, I pray as Jesus taught us to pray, may your kingdom come here in America, here in our neighborhoods, here in our world. May your will be done here in America, here in our community, in our neighborhoods, here in our world, just as it is in heaven. I pray that you would empower and anoint your church to shine the light bright in the days ahead, that we would invade the darkness. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, our one Lord and our one Savior. And the church, wherever the church is, said, Amen. Amen. Amen.